This episode is brought to you by Vonage. Your business needs more than an 800 number. With Vonage Voice API, you can provide the call experience your customers expect and get the data your team needs. From call analytics and virtual assistance to automatic speech recognition and text-to-speech in multiple languages. Your customer service team can help more people in more places. And with in-app voice, your customers can easily contact you the moment they have a question. Take your calls to the next level with Vonage Voice API. Learn more at Vonage.com. Scott for Scott's here. Do you hear that? Bring the mic in close. That's not how the grass should sound. There's weeds everywhere on this lawn. It's time to take action with Scott's Turf Builder Triple Action. It gets three jobs done at once, kills weeds, prevents crabgrass, and feeds your lawn so it keeps growing strong. Ah, much better. Get a bag of Scott's Triple Action today. It's guaranteed or your money back. Feed your lawn. Feed it. Hey everyone, Ray here. I've got a book recommendation for you. Best-selling author James D. Shipman blends fact and fiction in Beyond the Wire, a gripping novel based on one of the most extraordinary true stories of World War II, The Prisoner Revolt at Auschwitz. On October 7, 1944, prisoners assigned to Crematorium 4 at the Auschwitz-Birkenau Killing Center did something truly astonishing. They rose in revolt. Despite being unarmed, severely malnourished, and outnumbered by thousands of ruthless soldiers, a group of prisoners fought back against the evil of their captors. Though ultimately unsuccessful, the Auschwitz Prisoner Revolt of 1944 survives as a brilliant flashpoint of light and hope amidst the darkness of that infamous murder factory. James D. Shipman's harrowing, fact-based novel alternates between the perspectives of a Nazi officer, a Jewish woman involved in the resistance, and a male prisoner forced to work in the crematoriums, bringing to life the most spectacular mutiny in the history of Auschwitz. Beyond the Wire by James D. Shipman is available now everywhere books are sold. For more information, visit james-shipman.com. Hello, and thank you for listening to the History of World War II podcast, episode 356, interview with Philip Martin about his book, From Orphan to High Flyer, a spoken autobiography. This book by RAF pilot Dennis Elliott and Philip Martin covers the incredible story of Dennis's life. From the horrors of a Victorian-style orphanage and brutal foster parents, Dennis will go on to pilot American B-24 Liberators against the Japanese in Asia, defying death many times. And it's because of the war that Dennis will be able to escape the hell that was his childhood, fight for his country, and travel the world. Mr. Martin, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you for having me here, sir. Absolutely. I have to say, when I was reading your book, a whole bunch of memories came back of me sitting down with my grandfather, telling me a bunch of stories. I only understood half of them because I was a kid, but I was mesmerized. And of course, the other part of that is that person who changed your life meant so much to you and and me. Um, They're not here anymore. So you have the wonderful memories, but you also have the the bitterness bitterness of missing them. Yes, absolutely. It's it's quite hard to comprehend um, the lives and the that generation lived really in such a pivotal point in human history. And yeah, it's just hard to believe that something so spectacular happened within such a short amount of years, as far as history goes, at least. Yeah. So, yeah an amazing generation. What, what I enjoyed about your book a lot was, you know, as I'm going through this, I'm doing big sweeps of history and giant battles and whatever. And here's a book, here's a story about one guy with the most humblest of beginnings. And yet he's able to contribute to the war effort in a very specific, powerful way. And so his, his journey is almost rags to riches, if you will. So if you could please introduce us to yourself and tell us a little bit about how you met Dennis Elliott. Well, good evening to everyone, or good day, should I say, to everyone <laughs> listening to this. Uh, so essentially, when I was 10 years old in the summer of 2005, um, Dennis sold his car to my mother. 
and mm -hmm. they became friends you know their social circles overlapped and things like that and they became friends right so from then on what well, dennis would quite often be invited to our sunday lunches and over the years kind of that's just how it unproceeded but when i entered my teenage years I developed a very strong interest in history, very strong. So mm -hmm. whenever Dennis was over, I began to ask him about, you know, just basic questions. You know, where did you serve? What mm -hmm. aircraft did you fly? <laughs> Things like that. Mm -hmm. And then that's how it proceeded for another few years. But the pivotal point, and I guess the foundation of where we are now, is that when I was 18, I began to help him with his garden on Saturdays, because he asked me if I'd be willing to help him around the house with the garden, and I mm. agreed. So every Saturday I'd go over and I'd do whatever it is he asked me, and then afterwards we would sit down and we would play chess and we would talk, mm -hmm. and he would show me his logbooks, you know, and then wow. the story star started to come out, <laughs> and it was absolutely fascinating. And during this time, his friendship with my mother really improved as well, so this turned into what shopping them twice a week and him coming over for lunch every Sunday and days mm -hmm. out and me going over every Saturday and Dennis never had any family of his own and really? we didn't discover the truth about his family until last May believe it or not May 2021 wow so we kind of became a trio <laughs> you see mm -hmm. and you know, I would just be in his house looking at these um, log books and I was just absolutely mesmerized kind of and with these stories because it's just so hard um, to fathom what these men and women went and went through. Yes. In you know, especially in comparison um, to now in such a time of, of prosperity and, and riches, you know, and food and on a fridge and water out of a tap, you know. So. Right. <laughs> You know, it's a been stark contrast to what a lot of that generation went through. So I just listened and we grew really close, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, we were genuinely best friends. Then in 2018, Dennis became very ill over the course of a week. So because you because to remember, too, is that we spoke on the phone every night, mm -hmm. my mother and Dennis and me and Dennis. Right. So on the Tuesday, he told me he wasn't too well. Then the Wednesday and Thursday got worse. And on the Friday... He basically said, look, I can't go shopping, you know, it's, I just mm. can't, I just, I'm too ill. And I said, okay, is there anything you need me to get you? And he gave me a list and I went over. Anyway, point is, he looked horrible. He looked right. really bad. And I said to my mother, upon them getting home, I said, look, we're going to have to keep an eye out on this because this isn't good. Right. So we went over on the Saturday and unbeknownst to us, he was on the floor at this point, it collapsed. Oh. And, but you see, the thing is, is that he responded to our question quite somehow in a very angry voice so we assumed you know he's fine he's heard us he's you know he just wants right. you know we'll get back and yeah it's good and we had a key but but the door was locked on the inside as well so we couldn't um get in so the so we didn't hear from him all all evening and from the next day and then we went back and same room but this time he was just talking about gibberish so basically we managed to get him out with the help of the police and the ambulance and mm -hmm. he was in hospital for a month and I visited him every day and wow. after I kind of comprehended what had happened I thought you know what I just have to get these stories down and yes. I never thought of a book as such I just thought I, I just have to record them in some format and you know as the wheels turned I quickly kind of realized that there's so much value in the life he lived and what he overcame and what he achieved in his life you know mm -hmm. that there would be a lot of people who could gain a lot from it. And it would be a way to shine a light on Dennis as a man, the theater of war in which he thought, in which he fought in, right. just adding a, you know, just adding a grain of sand and what to the collective of human history and immortalizing him really, you know, and just introducing to the wider world, what a beautiful man, you know, my best friend is. Right. And that's when, what I thought at the time. So I thought, but how am I going to approach this? Because Dennis was always a very private man. Sure. And it was not in his nature to, you know, go out with his medals, you know. And it was just his his time in the RAF was something he did, but it wasn't him, you know. It, it ah. wasn't his identity. It was just something he did in his mm -hmm. life, you know. So I thought about it for two, three days. And I came up with my proposal as such. And basically, I went to visit him one afternoon 
in the hospital and I said, look, there's just something I want um, to ask you. Mm-hmm. And I basically spoke for about 10 minutes straight and fortunately he agreed. And <laughs> as cliche as it sounds, I completely <laughs> expected him to say no. Right. But he agreed and it was wonderful. So for the next two, three weeks, we just talked about it every day, you know, how we were going to do it and planning chapters and things like that. Mm -hmm. So we moved him into a new house, me, my mother and our neighbor, because Dennis couldn't live where he was. And he moved closer to us and I became his full time um, carer, which I was up until he passed away in September, the best three years of my life. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so once he was settled in, we we basically dove right in. And from May until December 2018, we worked on the initial manuscript. And prior to us starting, I wasn't exactly sure to what extent he would talk or what he would reveal. But, you know, he you know, he went he went into the depths of his soul and he dragged out a lot. And it was quite intense. I mean, to to see a 93 year old man as he was then sobbing in his chair talking about his first old foster father just beating him up at you know when Dennis was seven right. you know it, it it was quite something but you know that was contrasted with the elation with his and um, with his flying and other nice stories you know but mm-hmm. he really really went deep and if he couldn't rem- and if he couldn't remember something you know he would do everything he could um, to recall it and give me an answer sometimes two three days after Right. And it was just quite something to see to what extent he he went into himself to recall everything he could. It was incredible. It really right. was. Now, I'm glad you chose the format that you did, because as I'm reading this, you know, it's his words. It's the way he speaks. And I felt like I was sitting right there. And out of all of the veterans I've talked to, they had the same attitude as Dennis. You know, I had a job to do. They told me what to do. I was doing my part, pitching in. No big deal. Just that humility, you know, doing incredible depth defined things on a daily basis. Yes, it's incredible, isn't it? I mean, yeah. one consistency with Second World War veterans, especially, is that they always say, and but they didn't really do much, you know, they right. just did my bit. Right. And you go, really? Really? I've seen your medals and your records, you know? But yeah, yeah. But, with, but with the format, mm-hmm. I mean, it's a question and answer format. And the reason for that is because I knew I would be having that conversation with him anyway. Right. So I didn't want to have to take his words and try and mold it and filter it to fit a traditional ah. format because I felt a lot would have been lost in that process. And fortunately, a lot of people have said the kind words and what you did and that they feel as though they're sitting there with us. And that's yeah. kind of what I wanted to, you know, um, to convey because I think every lover of history has read books or whatever and thought, if only I could speak to this man or, you know, or be there and this hopefully goes some way of making that a reality, at least to the extent it can uh, in a book, you know. Exactly. So let's jump into Dennis's life. So his life, as you mentioned a, a minute ago, does not exactly start out very well. He's uh, he's separated from his parents at a young age. Can you tell us about that? Yes. So Dennis was the youngest of four siblings, and he was born on the 11th of July, 1924. Mm -hmm. And not long after he was born, his father left his mother and he started a second family with another woman. Right. And as a result, Dennis has no recollection of his father at all. Mm -hmm. So eventually, Dennis, his mother, meets a man who himself was married, but they end up together somehow. Right. And he either and we still don't know, but he either didn't want the kids or couldn't afford them. But so Dennis and Harold, his sec, uh, his older brother, ended up in an orphanage in West Norwood in London. And right. Walter, his oldest brother, who Dennis didn't even know existed until May of last year, and his sister Doris, they mm. went somewhere, but we don't know. But Doris was always kind of in the background during his childhood, but he never knew that they were related until after the war, by which time she had moved to Canada after meeting a Canadian serviceman. So... Mm. Dennis and Howard were in this orphanage for three years and it was absolutely awful, really. It was kind of run. Imagine some, some, you know, Victorian orphanage. There was no love, strict regiment, you, you know, whacked over under um, the rule of um, for anything, right. no love or affection. I mean, Dennis always said it was ran a bit like an army unit, really. Mm-hmm. So 
that was Dennis's life and um, for three years and in about so from the ages of three to seven so when mm-hmm. Dennis is seven which is a, which is 1931 him and Howard are moved to the first foster family in a small town named Orpington which is now part of greater London but then was Kent right and things in a way in quite a lot of ways get worse than for Dennis you know because unfortunately Howard was sent away not long after for being a bad boy Ugh. as they told him right and Dennis uh, was subject to a lot of beatings and abuse from his first foster father who liked him to drink you know Mm-hmm. and he always said that his foster mother wasn't actually that bad of a woman she, she was quite nice but she just couldn't go against him sure. so beatings were common and you know as a result of this Dennis by his own omission was just a frightened little boy with no self-confidence esteem or belief in himself at all I mean he would go to school every day and he would right. all, almost always be laid because he had to do all the washing up he wasn't given breakfast so as a result he was caned in school for being late Wow. Quite often, you know, because right. basically if you were late so many times in a week, you were caned. And Dennis was with them for about two years. So in the end, he just, after being caned by the headmaster, you know, again, he just broke down in the headmaster's office and told him everything. And two weeks later, Dennis was sent to the second foster family. But the abuse was so bad. Right. that the postman who lived next door told Dennis when he was 12 that he had actually raised concerns with the council as well. Mm-hmm. So, you know, so it was pretty grim to to put it mildly. So Dennis was then sent to his second foster family in the nearby village of Farnborough, which is pretty much next to Orpington. Now, that was a lot better, but oh, the good. couple themselves are in their 50s. So it was a very, shall we say, loveless environment. I mean, and Dennis mm-hmm. was never shown any affection or like, or you know, hugs or anything like that. Right. Which did bother him actually, but he got. But it was a lot better. You know, he was given some responsibilities. He'd take him a dog out. He'd do some shopping and chores, mm-hmm. and he got on with his foster father, his second foster father, really well. You know, he taught him things. You know, how to maintain a bicycle and put it together and take it apart and oil the mm-hmm. chain, things like that. And right. they did have a bond and they did have a good relationship. But his foster father was a lot more. Sorry, his foster mother was a lot more. You know, traditional Victorian, shall we say. Right. But fortunately, Dennis was soon joined by a younger boy named Billy, and mm-hmm. uh, they became really, really good friends. And, um, you know, and they stayed in touch for many, many years, you know, up until well, Billy and passed away, actually. So that was good. And But the scars were still there with Dennis. And, you know, in school, you know, he'd be playing um, um, cricket and the ball would come his way and he would just run away. It was that bad. He sure. just had no belief or confidence in himself at all. And it was quite well, telling that he always said that the Second World War was the best thing to ever happen to him and personally, right. because, you know, his life began to, to change. And to me, that phrase encapsulates a lot. It really does. Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, very Dickensian, Victorian, like you were saying. So he yeah. does eventually have a father-like figure in his life. He does eventually have a friend. But you're right. I mean, this he. I'm sh- I'm afraid at this point he's afraid of his own shadow, and 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 he was yeah. completely justified. But the, I'm sorry. Go ahead. The, go yeah, ahead. but the, but one sad thing I really want to bring up is yes. both foster both sets of foster parents kept Dennis away from Harold because Harold tried to initiate contact twice. Oh. And what we still don't know is Dennis's mother kept in touch with Harold and Doris. We know that, but obviously mm-hmm. not Dennis. And Harold tried to initiate contact twice. Right. And the first set of foster parents basically told him to stay away. And the, his second foster mother mm-hmm. told him when Howard waited outside his school and wanted to talk about the past, Dennis just ran away. Because his second right. foster mother had said, "He's you never speak to him under any circumstances. Do you understand things like that?" Right. And Dennis some would just listen, because he just didn't have that that confidence and that belief. Right. And unfortunately, in November 1940, Harold was sunk on the MV Nottingham by a German U-boat, and you know oh, was killed. So God. they never spoke again after that. And Dennis never, you know, and who knows is what Howard wanted to say. But right. we believe that. You know, contact with his his mother would have would have um, would have happened, but 
you know, it's just a tragedy, really. Yeah. So as 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 crazy as things are in Dennis's life, very little good, a lot of bad. However, as you and I know, the the wider world doesn't really care about Dennis. And the great equalizer war comes along and suddenly this very young what teenager is in the air training corps, but it's I think it's here that he's given some responsibility. He begins to find himself after all the the horrendous beginnings that he had. Yeah. yeah, so Dennis being in London or growing up just outside of London, he was right in the heart of the of the Blitz and the mm-hmm. Battle of Britain. Um, pretty And in his job, which he started uh, when he was 15 in mm. 1939, the summer of 39, you know, he very quickly advanced in the job because so many were being called up. Oh, and right. even and even watching him some speak about this, you could see the happiness when he talks about um, the new responsibilities being all taken on and the new, you know, and how his job would evolve over time. Right. And very quickly, that little seed of confidence began to kind of grow, you know. And very soon, he joined um, as a volunteer the fire service mm-hmm. in the summer of 1940 because every able bodied person was expected to contribute to the war effort in some form. Right. And not long after that, he joined the Air Defense Cadet Corps in, in October 1940, which in February 41 became the Air Training Corps. And Dennis said, you know, For the first time in my life, I began to, you know, pass exams, meet new friends, you know, what handle weapons Uh, and just and just begin to believe in myself. And that and that seed really sprouted at this point, you know, mm -hmm. and it was just nice to see that Dennis kind of had this belonging and this kind of um, these first, you know, these first tastes of confidence. And he just said um, that the air training corps became um, the most important part of his life. You know, he would. He would, um, excuse me, he would cycle home from work, often under the sound of anti-aircraft fire and bombs going off and things like that. He would get, he would just eat as quick as he could off to the air um, training corps. And he was there by, you know, by the end for five days a week, you know, and he just loved it. He loved Mm. it. And he passed exams. And like I said, he just started to believe in himself for the first time in his life. Here's a question for you. What would you do to save humanity and How far would you go to stop someone who is getting in your way? The ancient rivalry of assassins and Templars cuts to the heart of good versus evil. But it wasn't always clear who was good and who was evil. Plug in to explore the amazing world of medieval feuds. Echoes of History, Assassins versus Templars, is a special collaboration between History Hit and Ubisoft the masterminds behind the Assassin's Creed games. Hosted by Dan Snow from History Hit and Matt Lewis from Gone Medieval, together they will take a close look at the real history of the secret societies, which inspired the Assassin's Brotherhood and the Templar Order in the Assassin's Creed games. Plus, they will bring on other premier historians as they discuss unearthing the myths of the Grail and who really was the inspiration for the main characters in the game. Echoes of History, Assassins vs. Templars podcast is available right now wherever you get your podcasts. Listen and subscribe to Echoes of History today to discover the hidden truths that have shaped our world and inspired the video game series. That's Echoes of History wherever you get your podcasts. Listen today and subscribe for more. Right. Now, this was one of the... the part of the books that I really enjoyed because here you have this very young Dennis and as, as you said he is damaged goods at best but I don't think people truly appreciate the number of subjects that someone has to learn in order to be a successful pilot so here's this young man with probably very little confidence and suddenly he's got to learn airmanship meteorology navigation aircraft yeah. recognition morse I mean I I think being I'm guessing and you can tell me but Tackling those subjects and doing well is, you know, he starts to get confidence in himself. Yeah, this is it. And I mean, he's not even in the in, I mean, the Royal Air Force or proper yet. You know, right. he's just preparing to go in and he's taking on so many different subjects and he just thrived with it. You know, he mm-hmm. loved the lectures. He loved all of it, you know. And, you know, it got to the point where when he was training to be a pilot, what proper, he was helping others and with Morse code. <laughs> Because he, right. because he became so unproficient at it, you, wow. you know. Yeah, 
That's amazing. And he does spend some time, and you were mentioning this, I think, earlier, <clears throat> or maybe it's in the future. He spent some time doing uh, some training at Big and Hill, Big and Hill, obviously in, uh, what, southern London area? I'm trying to remember. Yeah, so Big and Hill is obviously the iconic airfield from the Big, Battle of Britain, and yes. then it's only grew up a few miles away from it. So his Air Training Corps unit did have the opportunity to camp out at Biggin Hill and it was kind of how do you say it, it was an introduction I guess to flying and you know the day-to-day workings of a of an airfield mm-hmm. so you know they had the same they had their meals and with the ground crew and they had the opportunity to go up into I mean to aircraft so in Dennis's case he went up in a Blenheim right. and he and they drew lots for where each would sit and Dan Dennis drew on the co-pilot seat and quickly changed them for the rear gunner after noticing that the previous occupant of the seat had vomited everywhere. <laughs> and so he went into the into the rear gunner seat and right. ironically and, and they went up and ironically he hated every minute of it <laughs> because of the G because of the G forces right. and you know and all of that. And he basically swore that he would never go up in an aircraft again, which is ironic, isn't it? But yeah. <laughs> how I have to ask how roughly how tall was Dennis, uh, I'd say, I'd say at that point he was maybe five nine. Okay, there. all right. Because I mean, I, an inch. right? I picture a very slight frame, not yeah. too tall, but but in the plane, and you know, just yeah, absolutely doing the best he can. So <laughs> what I what I what I enjoyed next was so here's this young man, teenager, who's just beginning to see a larger world. He knows that his country's under attack. But it's not like he's, you know, his world is very small because of his experiences thus far, which is about to change in December of 1942 when he's being told that he will be leaving the home island. Well, what's interesting is six months prior to, to his call up in October 42, Dennis mm-hmm. went to the recruiting office with his best friend from the air training corps, with Cyril Goldsack, and right. they went to just make sure that they got into the RAF. And they mm-hmm. weren't called up into the army or navy. Right. And Dennis walks in and he says, because again he didn't believe in himself really. He said, "I want to be a, a wireless operator." And the chap behind the counter or the desk said, "Oh, don't. Oh, we got enough of those. I'll put you both down as pilots." Right. And okay. throughout his life and throughout the book, <laughs> there are little things like that that seem so insignificant at the time. Right. But yet radically change the course of his life so for example dennis never wanted to go into the air force he wanted to go in in, into the navy because the sea was always his true love but his foster mother wouldn't let him go to the sea cadets because the sea cadets and were closer to london and obviously london was being bombed quite heavily so he went in into the air training corps and then again with um at the recruiting office you know little things that Changed his life so much, and this um, continues on and throughout his life, really. Right. Oh, that's amazing. So he's going to end up doing some more training in uh, in, in Af- Southern Africa, I believe. Yeah. So Dennis was put on the SS Rangatiki from Liverpool in December '42, mm-hmm. and they set sail for South Africa. And that's quite a time in his life, actually. And and he loved speaking about it because he was at sea. And right. he loved the sea. <laughs> right. And um, it's it's quite something, really, because because you because you just even in the even in the book itself, I think you kind of sense this absolute joy he had about being out on deck and right. you know being on a ship and going through the crossing the line ceremony. Which, oh yes, <laughs> which was quite yeah, which was quite fun. <laughs> Essentially, they were they you know i'm sure anybody listening to this with a naval background has probably gone through something like that but essentially there was a king neptune with a crown on and you know and they were all taken down into the lower decks and sprayed with hoses and dennis was covered in some sort of muck and you know (laughs) and he got a certificate saying he crossed the line but in the end uh yeah one of the of the crewman ordered said that the captain ordered it um, to be stopped because they were all all, la- all ladies on board so they couldn't you know act in such a manner right. so that was so, so a stop was put to that but i mean it wasn't all all jolly you know because at one point they were ordered down below deck because allegedly on um, the convoy in front of them had been hit um, by german u-boats and mm-hmm. i think two ships had been sunk i believe wow. and there were several bodies you know, floating in the water. So the risk was there. And apparently Dennis claimed to me that their convoy was attacked as well. But fortunately, uh, the naval escort they were in 
had managed to to uh, to uh, to and to sink at least one U-boat and with depth forge or charges. Right. Yeah, so again, he survives that, and he's going to begin his training proper as a pilot, but even that can't go perfectly at first. Yeah, so they arrive in South Africa, and they're put on the famous old blue train to South Asia, or Zimbabwe as it is now, mm-hmm. and Dennis immediately falls sick of malaria. So oh. he's in hospital for, you know, for about two weeks, begging to, to go home. He just wants to go home. Sure. And actually, in the book, there's a very beautiful poem that Dennis wrote at that time. And uh, it's it, it's quite stirring, actually. But, you know, Dennis recovers and he starts on the pilot course. He, the first school he goes to was Hillside, which he was at from the 20th of January to the 4th of June, 43. And there's not a single aircraft there. It's all theory. <laughs> right. Ten exams on ten subjects, oh. you know, four you know, yeah, in, in five months, you know, and yeah. it's quite because I believe, I believe, yeah, it was airmanship, navigation, meteorology, aero engines, flight instruments, signals, which included Morse code, bombing right. theory, gunnery fear theory, pyrotechnics, and aircraft recognition. And that's a, quite a lot for an 18 year old <laughs> to take on, you know, right. He just wanted to be a signals guy, and now he's got to do the whole buffet, the whole Well, plate. this is it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, even when he was there, he he went to the CO, to the right. commanding officer, and said, look, I don't think I'm I'm made I'm to be a pilot. I want to be a wireless operator. Right. And apparently the commanding officer got very angry <laughs> and said to him, you know, you'll be a damn good pilot, and we've got enough for wireless operators. Just study hard and forget anything about becoming a wireless wow. operator. So Dennis kind of went, oh, okay, yeah. then. And carried on training to be a pilot. And as you can see, it's another, you know, small little thing that had big consequences right. for Dennis's life, you know. And of course, what Dennis may or may not know, but you and I know, is that the bomber pilots for the RAF were the, the, the number of casualties, the percentage of casualties after a sortie was just horrendous. They oh, needed massive. Yeah, they yeah. needed as many replacement pilots as they could get as fast as they could get them. Yeah, so the course itself and was actually um, condensed by quite a few few weeks, and just to make up for mm. the losses, and just to get as many aircrew right. on active service as possible. So I guess that I, so that obviously added a another layer of um, of, of difficulty, I guess, having to pass a course in less time. Right. But Dennis, but but another seemingly small decision is Dennis actually wanted to go onto the um, more fighter stream, mm-hmm. and his his um. His Tiger Moth instructor, his final one, because he had three. Right. He he vetoed it on the basis that Dennison was too soft on the controls. <laughs> so he said, you know, and what by the time you had nursed your Spitfire into a rate one turn, you would have been shot down three times. So Yes. You know, so off Dennis went onto the bomber stream and onto Oxford's, which was his first, shall we say, bigger or training aircraft. Right. And we're we're gonna try to keep to the best of our ability, we'll try to keep a record of all the different planes that Dennis ends up flying throughout the yes. years. Um, but uh, whatever happens next, please, please feel free to tell us. But I do know that, uh, is it May of 1944, he ends up in India. Um, and he's got a, a whole set new of experiences there as well. Yeah, so after Dennis leaves in Rhodesia, including surviving a horrific instructor, Right. He finds himself in Palestine, forms his crew in Palestine, and they or and they convert onto the Vickers Wellington. Mm-hmm. From there, sent out to India, they arrive at RAF Ulkola, where mm-hmm. Dennis converts and his crew at this point operate uh, convert onto the American B twenty four Liberator, and this takes place over about two months, from about the fourteenth of August to the fifteenth of October, nineteen forty four. And there are lectures and stuff having to learn the in, intrinsic to, intrinsic um, little things of a new aircraft. Mm-hmm. And after that, at the ripe old age of 20 and a, a quarter, what Dennis finds himself <laughs> on, on 159 Squadron right. in West Bengal, about 70 miles west of Calcutta, under the, under the command of the legendary Wing Commander James Blackburn. 
Yes, and, and we'll talk about him in, uh, in just a moment. But but what I want everybody to know is, so Dennis is training. He's he's going to be on the Liberator, but because of the way has the war has worked out with with the uh, various fronts in this area. He and his crews, once they're up and running, they're going to have to take very long flights just to get to the enemy, whether it's uh, laying mines or whatever. But the point is, there. He, once he gets going, it's not like a two or three hour sortie. I mean, they're going to be in the hour like 13 hours in one go. Just incredible. Yeah, I mean, his the yeah Dennis's operations because they had to cross on the Bay of Bengal right so there and back yeah 13 14 hours and was excuse me was the norm it was the norm and the longest actually and the longest raid he went on was the three and Penang raids and Dennis was only one of a very small handful of men to actually go on all three but at the time they were the longest RAF bombing or mining runs in history and there was 119 hours with some of the aircraft and report um, are recorded as, as as lasting, you know. Right. 18, 19 hours. And the B-24 Liberator, its range was extended. It's, it's a remarkable story, actually, in the Penang Age. Yeah. Because one time I had to drive from Florida to Virginia, and that took 15 hours. And I was like, never again do I ever want to step into a car. I can only imagine <laughs> 13 hours in a rumbling plane but you know like he said he had a job to do so he takes his first flight uh excuse me his first flight as a pilot on november 7th 1944 and he was supposed to go on a bomb run but it turns out his allies the american observers didn't exactly have all their information uh together yeah so dennis um so this was meant to be dennis's first uh operation active operation, shall we say, as a captain. Because mm-hmm. prior to that, he he had been screened. So basically, he went as a co-pilot to an experienced pilot who taught him the, shall we say, and, and the nature of conducting an operation and, you know, just little tricks of it and just to ensure that, you know, to put Dennis in, in the best position right. possible to, to, conduct, uh, to conduct operations and lead his crew. So, mm-hmm. yeah, so... With so with this one, Dennis was screened again because it was believed that they were attacking large groups of, or a large group of Japanese ships. Right. But what happened is that the Americans who had spotted these had actually spotted a group of islands, but they were at such a high altitude oh. and these small islands and, and were being hit by by strong winds, which create and which can created a you know a wake or um, so oh, to speak after right. the after the island. So they believed them, they, them, they were shipping. So obviously, you know, all the aircraft can get there and <laughs> yeah. cover them, but they're just islands. Yeah. But from what Dennis said, and the, the squadron or the men on the aircraft, they were quite happy actually about it, <laughs> but, they, um, but they weren't going into, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, islands don't shoot back. So we're, we're okay with that. So the next part of your book is, is kind of the meat of Dennis's contribution to the war. Um, can I get you to describe some of the flights that he takes? And as you do that, if you, in, in, in any way that you want, if you could weave in um, Commander Blackburn, because that man was somebody I would want on my team any day of the week. Yeah, so James Blackburn, just to give the foundation, Wing Commander James Blackburn, he was just one of those men who just thrived in, in war, mm-hmm. in war, you know? And... You know, according to Dennis, he flew 200 operational flights wow. during the war. You know, right. he commanded he commanded five squadrons all, all during the war. You know, I'm not just in the Far East, but in North Africa as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, in, in you know, and he was just one of those men, just one of those leaders who his men worshipped. And I've seen his archive at the in, Imperial War Museum, right. and there are a lot of letters in there from men who served under him and things like that. And there's just this absolute, you know, these men just admire him and it's not hard to understand why, because, you know, he led from the front. Mm -hmm. He was a very innovative commanding officer. You know, he didn't like to fly unless there was a sense of of danger, you know, (laughs) flying, you know, it just didn't really interest him unless it was, yeah, unless unless it was on operations. It just wasn't him. And he had that charisma. He just had that, that leadership quality, 
Yeah. And he inspired all of those around him. And you see this from men who served on him under multiple squadrons and were not just with just one five nine squadron. Mm-hmm. And he was just a very, very fascinating man. And you see, you know, and you see throughout even even in Dennis's time on the squadron, you, you know, yeah, he just some of the some of the innovations he came up with and were quite something because even prior to because prior to Blackburn arriving on 159 Squadron, things weren't that good on there, you know. I mean, right. morale wasn't that high, and you know, and there were issues with the number of aircraft, things like that. Mm-hmm. And Dennis himself says that after Blackburn left, which was in January '45, things did begin to erode again somewhat, you know. So he right. was just one of those men who just had that that magic touch, would so to speak. <laughs> right. So, I mean. One Can, example. Sorry, yeah. gone. No, I was just just real quick. I just want to say one of the things that I loved about Blackburn is one. I mean, you you get the sense, even though he was brave and maybe a little crazy, um, he he seemed to be able to control his ego as in what do my men need? What can I give them to be better pilots and get the job done? It was all about the mission. And and I think that shone through for his men. And that's another reason to uh, respect him. And I mean, he wasn't one really, he didn't care about hierarchy, you know? Right. So one big example of that is that Dennis and his best friend on the squadron, an Australian named Carl um, Fristrom, mm-hmm. they got all this some furniture and drinks together and were for the Christmas party in the non, <laughs> in the non commissioned mess, you know? Right. And Blackburn walked past and saw this and said, yeah, this is where I belong. <laughs> and he stayed with and, you know, and celebrated with all the non-commissioned airmen, right. which, you know, which considering how, shall we say, rigid hierarchy was exactly. in the Royal Air Force or the British Armed Forces, especially back then, yes. it was quite something. But he was just one of them, you know, mm-hmm. it's, it's just how he was. And, and he got a lot of respect and, 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 and admiration for that because yeah. he was just one of those men. And he was always looking at ways to kind of, you know, to to complete operations new targets you know new innovative ways in right. which to play the squadron's part in I mean the war effort so there's one story where when he arrived on on 159 squadron you know mm-hmm. he was told that they couldn't but they quite often couldn't hit certain targets because the storms were you know were so low you know like monsoon storms right. you know things like that so he said okay we'll just go over it <laughs> you know just things like that this is know? a plane we can't yeah, fly over yeah, it. We'll, just go, <laughs> yeah, we'll just go over the storms then you know you know there's always it's just things like that because right. from what because from what i understand there you know and before he arrived on 159 squadron there were those who were quite happy not to you know take on risks and sure. you know go on flights and he basically said no that this is not how it's going to work we're gonna you know right yeah we're gonna go on operations based on the true story that shocked the world I... critics are calling a spy among friends on mgm plus a thrilling new cold war drama treason that's what i'm accusing you of with spellbinding performances i am not a traitor starring emmy award winners damian lewis and guy pierce you're trying to get me killed Give me one reason why not. Are you lonesome? A spy among friends. Watch now, only on MGM Plus. Yes. So, so you've got this kind of person leading one five nine squad, uh, five nine squadron, and Dennis. You almost get the sense that he's almost like a father figure to Dennis as well. But he's certainly the type of instructor that Dennis needed, especially with Dennis's lack of confidence, if you will. Yeah, well, you know, what Dennis or what Dennis always said to me that when he knew that Blackburn was flying, it made him feel safe. Right, you know, right. But if he was there, I mean, nothing would have happened to him. And wow, you know, you, and at this point in his life, you just see this this confident young man arise. You know, where Dennis could just just take control under the most testing of circumstances: yes. enemy fire, engine fires, through storms. He can make those snap decisions. And get each member of his crew to um to do their job, quick thinking, you know. And it's just wonderful to see this frightened little boy just bloom into this confident young man. Exactly, doing a courageous, dangerous job, and 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 almost like Blackburn, very concerned about his crew and not just himself. Yeah, 
I mean, luckily for Dennis, him and his and, and his crew, they had very good and rapport, and they got on well. And he kept in touch with them actually. Oh, nice. Long after the war, and Dennis actually became um, the godfather to his navigators or um, what um, what daughter. Nice. And I have a, a photo of Dennis, uh, and Billy, and his navigator Len up up John and. Billy is holding Len's old daughter, and you know, and right. so they all kept in touch, and it was, it, and it was nice. But Dennis said he always had a pretty good, good crew overall. That yeah, and that that's priceless when it comes to something like conflict, war. So, can you give us an idea of some of uh, Dennis's more memorable moments during some of these flights? Uh, yeah, there's quite there's quite a lot, really, <laughs> isn't there? <laughs> what, just but, uh, whatever you want. I guess I guess the one that really that really stands out for me was Dennis's was Dennis's 18th operation. And it mm. took place on the 1st to the 2nd of January, 45. And Dennis, shall we say, came under some of the most testing circumstances I can imagine. And it still baffles me right. to this day. So essentially, they bombed the rail, a railway bridge, which... Uh, across the Managon Chassai River, which mm-hmm. is about 20 miles west of Bangkok. Anyway, so they arrive at the target, and you know, Len announces bomb doors open, and mm. just at that point, Dennis um, looks up, <laughs> and he sees a liberator on top of him with its um, um, bomb doors open. So you can imagine, you know, right? Yeah, <laughs> and unfortunately, it did happen with heavy bomber aircraft where oh, wow. sometimes one would find one on top of the other, drop the bombs and the, and the wings would come off. You, you know, there's quite a lot of stories and from, unfortunately, of that occurring in Europe and wow. elsewhere. So immediately Dennis orders um, the left rudder um, to be put on. He slides out and he joins the back of the queue, so to speak. Right. So they drop their, so yeah, so they drop their load and everything is looking good. Right. So on the way back, though, they they arrive face to face with a storm and they quickly conclude and there's no way um, to go around it. So Dennis says, you know, we're going to have to go through it. Mm -hmm. So they pile into this into this storm and they're just being thrown around. You know, there's hail, there's hail storm and there's hail batter in the aircraft. There's lightning all around them and they're just being absolutely thrown around. And. You know, and they eventually are chucked out of this storm quite quite a way off target. Right. And um, so they decide that they have to, I mean, they can't make it back and that they have to land elsewhere. Mm-hmm. And um, so they recalibrate or Len recalibrates on the course and they decided that they're going to go to Cox's Bazaar, which was an airfield on the northeast coast of the Bay of Bengal part of India then Bangladesh now but India then so on the way there they come into range of a British naval fleet which is working on the action to to retake Akiab Mm -hmm. so obviously Dennis's aircraft is mistook for a Japanese aircraft and these naval ships immediately open fire on fire on them right an anti-aircraft shell begins (sighs) to explode around the aircraft so Dennis immediately starts flashing the navigation lights to signal that they're friendly aircraft. Mm-hmm. So the firing stops. Then when they finally make it to Cox's Bazaar, Dennis realizes that they have enough fuel to make it into Chittagong, which was about 150 miles further up the coast. So that went fine. Right. Then on approach to Chittagong, bang, a huge shape comes past. Bang. And then another. And then another and so on. And oh Dennis quickly realizes that in the foggy conditions they were in, they'd just flown straight into a balloon bar- barrage, oh which God. was hoisted to protect ships and below. Right. So he quickly somehow makes it out the other side and they reach the airfield. And Dennis, he said he, he could just about see the runway lights. Mm-hmm. And because he could see the lights, he knew it was possible to land, but they had to do a maneuver that he learned in South and Rhodesia. So right. essentially it was a timed run. So what happened was, is they would fly 
level, <clears throat> so they would fly level with the aircraft, and the navigator, using a stopwatch, noted the time it took to fly along and the length of the runway. Right. Then once at the far end of the runway, the pilot made a, a, a rate one turn, which was also timed, mm -hmm. which repositioned the aircraft at the end of the runway, but facing the opposite direction. But they were still level with the runway. Right. So the pilot, again, flew along the length of the runway, and after the precise time it had taken to fly down the runway on the first pass had elapsed mm -hmm. the pilot made another rate one turn that was a duplicate of the first turn right so but they were at the beginning of the runway again then after the precise time recorded for the first turn had elapsed the aircraft was then known to be at the beginning of the runway so they could make a safe landing despite the foggy and conditions so even right. though they couldn't see they knew you know, yeah, the length math. based on the time. Yeah. So it's quite complex, but I, but I hope I've managed to convey it. Yes. But once <laughs> Dennis had been told that, that they should turn on their landing lights, so the people on the ground knew that they were friendly aircraft. Right. So once Dennis turned on his landing lights, he noticed there was a big steamroller <laughs> sitting at the beginning of, of the runway, oh. which, you know, and which if they hit... Oh, yeah. Would not be good to put it mildly. Right. So Dennis had to. So Dennis then had to just. Oh, goodness me. Yeah. So Dennis had to pull back on the <laughs> control column and get over the steamroller. But of course, they had lost, you know, length on yes. the runway, about 200 yards, he said. Right. So when the wheels touched, he had to slam on the brakes <laughs> as hard as he could, cool. which caused the brake shoes to catch fire. So then Dennis had to release some of the brakes for the fire to go out and then, and then put on the brakes again. And he said they made it to the aircraft with barely any distance left. And from there, he had to, you know, oh. make it into the um, control tower. So to summarize, he had a liberator with its bomb doors open and directly <laughs> above him at the um, on target. He had to navigate through a storm, came under friendly fire, right. somehow flew through a balloon garage, <laughs> landed in fog, right. and barely managed to get over a steamroller. It's just, you know, and that's it's one just, flight. That's one flight. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and he said when light came or, or when, um, when daylight returned and mm -hmm. they looked at the balloon barrage and they had no idea how they got <laughs> through it. Right. And Dennis realized or they later were told that they only had 20 gallons of fuel oh left in, in the Liberator, which for a Liberator is nothing. You know, I mean, you're exactly. looking at about a gallon a mile, aren't you? So yeah. it was absolutely nothing. And to just see Dennis conduct himself in that manner and take yeah. on the challenges. And even then, and I'm doing it now, I'm trying to just put it into just trying to just think what that must have been like. Yes. To 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 face those challenges and to conduct himself in the way he did. It's amazing. And oh, yeah. yeah, and to me that story, and there's many more like it. Sure. But that story has always symbolized what Dennis managed to become and from where he came to what he became. It was absolutely, it, 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 it was incredible um, to listen to and it's incredible to, to recall now. And I think it really illustrates some of the strength of the human spirit, you know, in what okay. one can overcome and what humans can do under the most trying of circumstances. Strength which, um, which we don't even know we have, you know. Exactly. So I have to say, by the time I finished reading that part of the book, one, my heart was racing a million miles a second. But also, like you just said, I could see how far Dennis has come from this, this abused orphan to someone who's like, oh, we have these five or six emergencies in a row all in one flight. I can mm. handle this and I can bring my men through. Absolutely incredible, meta incredible metamorphosis. Yeah, it's I mean, it's. Even to this day, it's, it, I still find it incredible. And I take so much from Dennis's life yeah. as a whole. And, you know, that strength is always there. I mean, I'm sure you and your listeners have, have seen it um, with, with Second World War veterans of men who, and men and women who have been through tough times. But there's a certain strength unto them, isn't there? Yes. There's a certain resolve which, you know, makes itself apparent and without having them to be spoken about, you know? Yes. And that's and what makes Dennis it even, that. Exactly. It <laughs> makes it even more respectable. So, and, and this is one of the instances after this mission or soon after this mission where uh, Dennis 
actually gets a good break because the brass is going to increase the number of um, hours or flying hours that you have to have before you're rotated out. But because his missions were 13 hours and whatever, you know, average, he's able to accrue his 300 hours pretty quickly. Yeah, I, I, but yeah, the, yeah, there was kind of a uh, there was a ratio of hours to operations, mm. whichever one you reached first, that was on the end of your tour. But obviously, due to the distance that you know that one five nine squadron are making at that point, right? Uh, Dennis and well, many of the men are reaching their hours and before, well, quite or quickly relative to the number of operations they were doing. Yeah. So the RAF uh, hierarchy extended uh, the number of operations that had to have been done, but Dennis had finished them by that point. But he did take on an extra, op- and this shows on the camaraderie of his crew, but he mm-hmm. took on an, an extra operation and which he didn't have to do in order that him and his crew um, could finish them together as one, you know? Oh, right. And that was all, you know, and that's quite something really. So when you yes. think of the risks um, um, that come with an operation, but, um, but he wanted him to do it and he in- insisted on it. Right. And fortunately it worked out quite well. Yes. The brotherhood of yeah. facing combat together. Yeah, so it's, Yeah, it's his uh, crew. Exactly. So there is so much to this book that we have not talked about. There's going to be more flying for Dennis. There's going to be more traveling, uh, this kid. But I want to save that for the readers, if I could. But before I let you go, um, and I missed this earlier, and I apologize. um, But as I'm covering the war from Malta's point of view right now, wasn't there a point during at some point in his life where uh, Dennis was able to bike around on Malta. Oh yeah. I was wondering yeah. if you had any of his um impressions with you. Well well Dennis was the um, Dennis was in Malta from from November nineteen forty nine until nineteen fifty two. He mm-hmm. flew Lancasters, the the iconic Arvo Lancasters right. from RAF Luca in Malta. And he yeah, and you know, the flying then was was completely different because obviously there was no water fight then, and right. the operations or the operations or the operational flying, shall we say, mm-hmm. they were working in in conjunction with um, the navy. You know, right. working them together with the navy, so you know, um, to tell them if sub if they were being shadowed by submarines and things like that. So their whole right. exercises were in conjunction with the Navy. And Dennis spent, you know, two good years, well, two and a half good years in, in Malta. And in that time, you know, he, he met Prince Philip and, you know, and the, <laughs> wow. the well, Princess Elizabeth, as she was then, mm-hmm. um, you know, inspected them the squadron. And he had some, he had some incredible stories, really. You know, he, um, he, he had to, he had to force land at Wheelers Field, which was an American, Airfield in Libya, I believe, during a sandstorm and things like that. And also, Lancasters by aircraft standards were getting so old at that point, you know. Right. So there were quite a lot of incidences. I mean, on one air sea rescue operation, it's 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 miraculous that 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 they managed to find them actually, because Dennis's crew and himself and another crew were in the control tower, right. and each section of the Mediterranean had its own le- letter and number, right? Mm-hmm. So they were split into boxes. And they were out on this patrol, and Dennis was adamant that he heard a mayday call. Mm. But no one else had heard this. Right. And Dennis thought about it, he said, for a few minutes. Because while as captain of the aircraft, he could take big decisions. He, you know, yeah. But if he was wrong, or it wasn't justified, then he'd be in big, big trouble. <laughs> right. But he was adamant he had heard this, and he recalled on the box number. So he diverted... And fortunately, his his um, belief was correct in that they found the lifeboat with the crew in it. Mm-hmm. And after, obviously, he contacted a, um, uh, a naval ship in, in the area, and they were all picked up, and it was all good. But what had happened was, according to the flight engineer of this crew, part right. of the port port wing had just all fallen off. Oh, that, I mean, that was it. So it right. you know it spun into the sea, right. and once they had and, and once they had all bailed out. They couldn't get out on the lifeboats, or or the lifeboat it wouldn't eject. So they had to like, hack it out, you know. Oh wow! And the funny, you know, and the funny story of it is, is that you know, because at Luca there were two uh, squadrons, thirty eight and thirty nine, I believe, and mm-hmm. Dennis was in thir- in thirty eight squadron, and this crew was from thirty nine Sam squadron, and you know, the flight engineer claimed that just before Dennis showed up, he said, "Bloody hell, guys!" If- if 38 squadron are, are on air sea rescue, it's just a we'll be here for bloody days. And, <laughs> and Dennis 
shows up, you know. <laughs> He's their the guardian horizon. angel. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, that's that's absolutely correct. Yeah, but you're right. The planes are getting older, and yeah, yeah maybe it's time a lot to of wear and tear, isn't there? <laughs> but but, um, but there's things yeah. like um, like this. Um, throughout um Dennis's time on Lancasters, you know, right. I mean, you know, brakes failing and engines failing, and oh, you know, the right. wing coming off and things like that. That's it's quite something, isn't it? Yes, but that reminds me. But just compare, just for a second, Dennis going, no, I heard something. I heard something. No one else has heard it. No, I heard something. Compare that to the seven-year-old who has absolutely exactly. no confidence. And this is the man that he has become. Exactly. And that was one of oh, those. Yes. And that's one of those threads that's spoken and unspoken throughout right. the book. And, I, and it's just... It's um, it's just something that, yeah, that I just find incredible. Yeah, I really do. And, and I, I ju- really do. And I just gotta say, because of my own memories with my grandfather, when I saw the picture of Dennis, you know, obviously the older man, I just wanted to give him the biggest hug in the world. Uh, but he has he's had a life that I can never touch, and uh, I'm I'm glad you uh, got in contact with me because this story was absolutely incredible. Yeah, thank you very much. Absolutely. It was so so. Um, we're, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, please. I mean, even, you know, even Dennis's year in the far, far east after his post-war flying, it's just, mm-hmm. you know, it's, 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 just, it's just incredible, really. I mean, yeah. you know, he, um, he um, you know, he came under, his train came under fire from suspected the Malayan or communists. He was right. held at gunpoint. He saw on the liberation, of, well, he was in Singapore just after its liberation, mm-hmm. you know, in Java when the Dutch were trying to retake him, the East Indies and just things like that. And it's just, just, it's incredible to see. I mean, he had to take single engine Sentinel aircrafts around in India, uh, literally around the Bay of Bengal from Cox's Bazaar. And he, and he was doing so much flying and he was exhausted and he just passed out of the um, um, controls. Oh. This happened twice, and he ended up in Bombay Military Hospital. But there's just so many stories like that. Yeah. And before I forget, it wasn't 39 Squadron in Mole 2. It was um, 37, 37 okay. and 38. So my yeah. mistake. But again, the life that he led, the things, it's almost like Forrest Gump, the things that he saw or was witness to, um, yeah. absolutely incredible. So again, I want to thank you for your time. I want to thank you for this book. It was amazing. Uh, is thank there you, any, sir. absolutely. Is there any final thoughts that you want to share with us about Dennis or maybe what he meant to you? Oof. <laughs> I know that's a lot. Dennis, that's yeah. a lot. Dennis Elliott was my best friend. He was my hero and he's the greatest man I ever met. I miss him every day. I think about him every day and he's forever embedded into my life. You know, just to to have known him for as long as I have and to have been his carer for three years, it was the greatest gift, you know, that someone could ever be and bestowed. And it's invaluable. And I'm so glad that people um, are able to to read about him now and and hear about him. You know, he was a truly incredible, beautiful man. And I'd say to anybody listening um, to this, if, if you have any contact personal relationships with any second world war veteran or any veteran on you know of any conflict i mean mm-hmm. not just a second world war but korea vietnam in, in the case of the u.s or, right. or just any conflict just get these stories down while you still can record these stories down there's such value in what these individuals went through you know such Absolutely. lessons and what for the future and we have such a responsibility to record this history and keep it alive so lessons can be learned by future generations you know mm-hmm. so please and especially in the case of those who fought in the second world war and korea you know there's not many years left right. you know so right. just and it doesn't have to be a book just in some form just get it down just Absolutely. get it down yeah. Well said, uh, Mr. Martin. Thank you for your time for everyone. Uh, this is, the book is called From Orphan to High Flyer, a Spoken Autobiography. Mr. Martin, thank you again for your time today. Thank you very much, sir.